Hello everybody and welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. My name is Deborah Hatswell and you're listening to BBR Investigations. The 25 year haunting on Pets Drive. Three mystery men found dead in a ghostly boat. Today I'm bringing you one case which I think stands out head above all of us when it comes to paranormal investigation. The case of an ordinary family who through serendipity are brought to a place by fate. They see, hear and experience many things we'd call supernatural or unexplained. Most investigation teams would immediately shout demon, you know, demonic possession, which in my opinion is very far from the truth. When you do that, you miss the facts that hundreds of families go through this. Sometimes it's connected to a home that they move into the land that that home's on, or an object brought home and displayed. There are so many reasons that activities can take place at a home or around a person. And I strongly believe this is a natural happening. Beneath all the noise and satanic panic and uproar, we have an ordinary family, ordinary families, seeing paranormal activity happen for generations. We need to normalise speaking about this. We have to make it easy for people to speak out on events happening around them without being sprayed with holy water or marked as possessed. Our case today takes place at the mouth of the River Neen that flows through the east of England. At 105 miles long, it is the 10th longest river in the UK. The river rises from three sources in Northamptonshire and flows into the North Sea via the Wash. From the west, it flows through Northampton, Wellingborough and Peterborough. Along the river, there are several homes, inns and farms that have their own local fame due to the ghosts and the spirits that call them home. The River Neen crosses different counties and meets up with Use, another well-known paranormal and cryptid hotspot. And like the Use, the Neen runs into the sea close to Kingsley. Recently, I was contacted by one family who've had consistent activity at their home. The family have a CCTV system. It's fitted and it shows the inside of the property and they also have external cameras fitted with a microphone attached. Over the month of March 2024, that system has recorded a number of anomalies and the family were willing to share them with me. First, let me give you a rundown on the case and the activity so far. The mother in the family is called Chrissy, and Chrissy and her family have lived in the home close to three decades. She was incredibly transparent with me and shared everything with me, openly really. She's aware of spirit, and up until now, the activity has been positive, and in some cases a little mischievous, but nothing really negative or tangible. Items will go missing for no reason and suddenly turn up in other rooms or at other points in time. In fact, there is a lot of activity that goes on at the address and we'll touch on that as I carry on reading. But I'd like to read to you from an ongoing conversation that I've had with Chrissy over the last few weeks. I asked if the activity had been consistent over the years and she said, We live on Pets Lane and yeah, the house has always been active. It was built in the 1830s. I put the cameras in to monitor one of my children who has autism as he gets up way too early and I want to keep an eye on him, make sure he's safe. When I fitted the cameras, I never thought I'd see something like this. I don't feel anything negative in my home at all, but I've never gone into or near my garage at night in all the years I've lived here. The garage gives me the heebie-jeebies. The cameras, audios picked up some sounds that are coming from the garage and they have creeped me out. I don't like that noise. You can hear that it sounds like chatter. I heard a loud bang outside earlier, so I hit record as fast as I could. And again, it sounds like it's picked up a noisy spirit of some kind, but I can hear running water. And then it goes quiet again at the end. But again, the sounds of water. I know I live right next to a riverbank. And there's an old pump house here back in the day. You know, We live on the coastal estuary. The voice, I believe, is being carried by the water. We've tried to debunk this audio. We've ruled out radio interference as the cause. There are no 
real homes or workshops or anything like that that have a CB radio or a long wave radio around us. It's not noisy from the port. It's not noise from the ships. Sometimes it sounds like it's trying to say something, almost like people are talking. The audio was captured on a camera mounted on our garage, watching out over the drive. I live rurally next to a riverbank, as I said, so my nearest neighbours are far away. I can promise you, it's silent all day long here. The night this happened, I was expecting my Tesco food delivery, so my, and my dogs have been barking on and off recently. This is a newly installed camera system, so I kept thinking that the dogs were barking that night at the Tesco man. I thought he'd pulled up, but he hadn't, and they weren't barking at him at all. This was what I recorded on the audio capture. I think we can all agree that that audio is startling and that is a very very small selection from four audio captures that we've had um, I think it's about 10-15 minutes in all. I asked Chrissy uh, about the audio and she was creeped out about it and I don't blame her because I've heard all of it and I'm creeped out about it. She said I would say my house is very haunted anyway but there are kind spirits here and I'm always respectful. I've seen many things when I've been out there on my drive and I've run back into the house, to be honest. It's that scary. I've lived here for 24 years, so I'm not easily scared, but this voice thing I don't like. If the audio captures were not bad enough, now the cameras have caught some strange dark mists in the house. Those mists were captured and I wanted your opinion on them. In one video where you see the dog, there's a hand that comes from an orb towards the end of the film. You can see it clearly at the end of the hall on the right. That's my bedroom. And no one was here apart from me and my middle son, who I was talking to in my kitchen at the time. We were nowhere near that hall. I asked Chrissy what she meant when she said she'd seen things when she was out in the drive that frightened her. And she said, Once, at the top of my drive, I saw a dark hooded figure just standing there. It was a quick glimpse, maybe ten seconds long. I was staring at it. And it just vanished. I should add my family history and some strange coincidences about this house. I was born here. It was my first home when I was a baby. I didn't know this as my parents moved out of the property when I was two. My mum hated it here and said I was a problem baby. She said I was always screaming and would never settle. So about 20 years ago, in fact, you know, myself and my ex-husband were looking for a house that was rural as we had several dogs and we both hated living in the town. So when we saw this place advertised, we came and saw it. It was extremely dilapidated and run down. We, we put an offer in and it was accepted. I couldn't wait to tell my mum and dad the news and ask my dad's advice as he was an electrical engineer and he's done up a lot of houses. So on a Sunday lunch at my mum's, I showed them the details and my mum laughed hysterically, looked at my dad and showed him where we were moving to and she said, oh, you silly cow, you were born there, that was your first home. So the lady I bought it from, Mrs Moore, was the lady that my parents sold it to. She was reluctant to sell it to me. She said it had given her nothing but bad luck and we're a nice family. I dismissed her. I said, it's fine. I was obviously meant to come back, so she relented and sold it to us. In the first year alone, I saw that shadow thing, and I hated it. I've also seen legs form in my glass double doors. I was pregnant with my son, and I was alone. My now ex-husband worked night, so it was just me and my three dogs. And it was night time, the dogs would go haywire. So I'd let them back, and I'd let them out, but they were never, never there. One night, I came back in and went to bed. Then there was this almighty noise. There were loud bangs on the old back door and the dogs started up again. I let them out. Nothing. That went on till about 5am. 
Random stuff disappears only to reappear months later. It's always freezing cold all of the time. There was so much activity, our doors would unscrew themselves often. The handles and hinges would also unscrew. I might add, one of the doors was sealed shut. We hadn't ever used it. It was extremely hard to get to, as the old extension was falling down. You'd have to climb over the rubble to get to that door, to even try and take it apart. That relationship broke down. I suffered extremely bad luck here. I miscarried in that hallway, and my parents died within five months of each other. Mrs Moore was right. Her son was killed on his bike at the top of the lane. My partner said this house is cursed. He hates it and he just wants to get out. My youngest child has had night terrors, as is my eldest son. We constantly hear noises coming from everywhere. The one thing I don't like is the chopping that my son hears when he's in his bedroom. That comes from the old cold store. The weird thing is, I don't want to leave here. It's like I'm its keeper. I said once to my partner, I'm like the gatekeeper from Ghostbusters. I'm not scared. I just want to know why this happens. And maybe even free it if it's trapped here. My son drew what he saw climbing up his bedroom wall once. It was a horrible black thing in the corner. And that's where all the orbs appear from. My nanny Pothero talked at me once when we were in church. I had my hands over my ears and she said, Can you hear that? And obviously I couldn't hear what she was saying, so she took my hands away from my ears and she said, Can you hear that? And I said, Yeah. What's all that singing? And she said, Ah, so you can hear them like me. It's like this house can be a bit of a portal sometimes. I honestly believe my family do come back here from their graves from time to time and check in. So that's why I've never felt like I should run away and never look back. I know I've got spiritual backup. It's just this one thing that isn't nice, that is mainly experienced outside. But if I don't do my sage and my protections, etc., it creeps back in. I asked Chrissy if she wanted to remain anonymous and I, if she wanted me to hide the address or the area that it happened in. And she didn't. She was incredibly open and honest with me. And she said, you can tell everyone all about this house and me. It's more my partner I'm concerned about, bless him. It does affect people who aren't born to this land more, I think. It's a hard thing to explain. But I have two ex-partners and I believe this house is the reason. My husband was a very lovely, caring man, but he changed so much when we came here. He became extremely depressed and irritable and a shadow of the man he was. Now he's not here. He's lovely again. In my second relationship, he became physically abusive and I asked him to leave. I've seen it drain the fun out of my current partner, but it was the first thing I spoke to him about when we got together. So he knows and he's prepared, but he will admit it's very hard living here and we have no luck with anything. It's like the house is constantly battling him. I honestly believe that. We both have good hearts and obviously are very open to it all. He's open too, which I think helps him there. He said many times, I've never known a place like this. I do feel for him. To be honest, I think there's something in that garage. I think it's that dark, nasty one trying to tell me something. It's the water noise as well that gets me. There have been a lot of deaths in this river and the house was the only one for miles around. You know, it was built in 1830. It was the only bit of above ground water for miles when I looked it up on the old maps. I know my relatives who have died had visited. My dad always says, if there's something to this afterlife, I'll come back and prove it to you, Chrissy. He never was a believer, but I know he's got me back. Plus my partner's seen him, made him jump. My dad was a bit of a prankster in life and he wouldn't hurt my boys. Not like this other thing. The amount of orbs I see on my camera now. I do wonder if my family are on patrol looking out for us. Thanks for listening, Deb. It really does help just sharing all of it. I wanted to interject at this point, as I have some strong feelings about the house and what it was built from. 
intuition tells me that some of the timbers in the home could be from one or more of the old ships that would wreck or wash up here. People in coastal areas all around the world use the timbers, the flotsam and jetsam that comes in in their homes and buildings. They're often used as lintels for windows and doors or, you know, ceiling joists. I know many old homes that have floors and doors made from old ships. Shiplap is often a name used in decoration, but that's exactly what it is. It's the old beams from ships. You get small glass windows from the cabins, you know, or some people will have an old beam as a fire mantle. Let's be honest. When scuttlers were involved, not a matchstick would be left on the beach. Every part would have been vital, picked up and whisked away. Chrissy mentioned to me that a partner does not like the attic in the home, and I think this could be a possible reason why. I don't know about you guys, but it seems to me that Chrissy is meant to be in this house. I also feel like she's its guardian in some way. She's holding back that dark force. I think it has something to do with the bloodline. The grandmother heard voices, as did Chris there, you know, and as do her boys. She's out there on the coastline like a literal lighthouse, shining for any spirit, entity or energy to see. Hundreds of people have died in the wash, in the river and out at sea. It's an area with a long history of ghostly horsemen, hooded monks and sailors long dead and gone. People report hearing voices crying out for help. Maidens singing like sirens to bring in boats on stormy nights. I would imagine there are lots of local families who have their own stories to tell along the coast and further into the farmlands and woodlands upstream. I'm going to use my online sources now to score old maps, archives and history articles to see what I can find out about that section of the coast. I think finding out if there are any wrecks in the area or people who have perished there due to tide and time or on their own land would be important. There could be many souls looking for a place to share their truth with the living, or we could be looking at something to do with the land. The house itself, as we know it, is very old. But what was on the land before the home was built? Was it priory owned? Was it owned by the church? Or other sects? Secret sects? We just don't know. All of this information needs to be collected before we'll know the answers. Kerry allowed me to share several of the captures with a number of investigators. They listened to the audio captures and studied the videos and have given their expert opinions on what they see, feel and sense. The evidence analyst did not know where the house is situated other than the county of Lincolnshire. They know nothing about the family other than it was a mum, sons and a partner. I did not give them background context, historical history or names of any family members or ex-tenants of the address. This was only been on my desk up to now. They haven't seen that. They've seen the videos and they've heard the audio. And when they finish their analysis, that's when I'll share it with them. You know, like me, when we share it, you're going to be amazed at just how close some people have come with what they've picked up on. And if you pick up on anything, please let me know in the comments below. It could be vital, it, even no matter how silly it sounds to you. If it pops into your mind or you feel it intuitively, jot it down and let me know. As many of you will be listening at home, like I said, and you'll want to see the footage and hear the audio. I have added a link to the video with all that information included and a link to the website where you can read the transcript of mine and Chrissy's conversation. I am really keen to hear what you guys think and to see if we have any EVP captures or captures on camera. I might have missed something and so may the other guys that looked at it. I'd also be interested in any psychic messages, automatic writing, intuitive thoughts any of your knowledge on history, on the area itself. Here are some of the cases and information that I've managed to collect so far. Now, I sent them over to um, Kat Chad, one of my friends, a long-time researcher and investigator with me. And she said, on the audio clip you sent over, Deb, I see something's trying to manifest on the left side of the door. 
There seems almost body-like flashes on the screen, but I'm not sure what it is, and it goes past so quickly. I'm inclined to say all of the activity is something to do with the river. I think some of the audio sounds like something trying to speak underwater. It sounds like people are saying, help me. And then it goes into more like the sound of drowning noises. Do they walk or live near a river? I also hear a very high pitched, I'm drowning. I have a strong feeling to ask, is there a boy that's seen something physical? Sam said, I watched all the clips and the originals that you sent over and that they show far more depth. I can see to me what looks like something transparent. It, it's at times, it's in front of certain books on that bookshelf. And then I see something dropping to the floor or what could be a see-through foot placed behind the drawers in line with the books. There are at least seven shadows and see-through shapes shooting from that area where the see-through thing is. I also see something that is see-through by the glass doors. A white vertical panel, almost, that's separate to the shape in front of the bookcase. Well, without knowing Sam, Chrissy actually said that she often sees what she calls see-through legs at that glass door. I wonder if someone stood there looking out. Susie said, I watched all the videos and I can see several dark shadows, orbs and a hand that appears on the door. The hand looks tiny to me. The audio sounds like chattering. I'd say it's different voices. I hear two, possibly three. I think the sounds are elemental and to do with water. Water has a memory and it holds on to it. It's something I've done a number of talks on over the years. I'm really interested in this case and I look forward to the updates, Deb. Now, let's look at possible shipwrecks that may be connected to this case in any way, shape or form. And I think like me, you might spot some significant connections. Now, loss of life happened at the mouth of the Neen on August the 22nd, 1893, when nine people drowned in a boating accident at Sutton Bridge, and that's right where the house is. A group of anglers from Sheffield had hired a small sailing boat at Sutton Bridge to take them on a pleasure cruise, which included some light fishing and a trip to forage sapphire on the marshes. There were two families and an engaged couple on board the boat that day. The weather was windy and there were some rain showers. The boat was in capable hands and local river pilot Edwin Burton and his son were at the helm. The party set off before lunch and sailed down the river to the lighthouses that guide shipping down the channel into the river mouth. Everything went well and the happy sailors set off back to the bay when the boat was caught by a sudden squall and unfortunately capsized, throwing all its occupants into the river. Some children collecting samphire near the lighthouse saw people in the water shouting for help and they ran as fast as they could and raised the alarm. Despite the efforts from many of the locals in the community, there was only one survivor, a lady named Mrs Smith. The pilot, Edward Burton, 41, and his son Bernard, 12, was buried in the same grave in Sutton Bridge the following Friday. The victims from Sheffield were buried in their own cities. The pilot's son Bernard was a young boy of 12 when he passed and I wonder if he finds solace with Chrissa and the boys at her home. She's a mother and I think he may be drawn to that energy and probably enjoys seeing the boy. The boat they set sailing also appears to have its own spooky, mysterious past. It had been bought by Edwin in King's Lynn after the boat had been found drifting at sea with the corpses of three sailors on board. Where that boat had come from and the identity of the sailors was never established. There are still the remains of another small wooden boat that had been wrecked in the area. The rusted remains sit out on the salt marsh to the west of the island, in the wash, between the River Neen and the River Great Ouse outfalls. The river gave its name to a boat named the Neen of Wisbitch, one of whose crew was drowned in the river in 1830 
the year the house was built. A very quick search led me to information that may be good going forward, as I found so many people had perished in the water around the area. Four men's lives were lost when the barge of the Neem Valley sailed for Gravesend on the 27th of June 1854, another boat that was named after the area. It was bound for Portland Bay and Port Ferry, with nine passengers and a general cargo on board. In October of that year, the vessel ran aground when they mistook their bearing due to a fog bank hiding the shoreline. But the reports of deaths on the river, or the river's mouth, continue to this present day. Another soul was lost in the river on the 11th and 12th of January 1798 when the North Sea storm surge caused extensive flooding. They had the highest water levels they'd had since the North Sea flood in 53 and the flooding affected both banks of the river at Whiz Beach. A 70-year-old woman drowned in her flooded home after the Neen burst its banks, forcing thousands of people to evacuate their homes. The 1953 North Sea Flood didn't just happen in England, it stuck the Netherlands, the northwest coast of Belgium, England and Scotland. Most sea defences could not hold back that surge and some of the tides were 5.6 metres high. The death of an old man was declared in the newspapers when his body was found in the river so badly decomposed that pathologists couldn't explain his death. An inquest heard that Lindsay Pryor, 45, known commonly as Bert, disappeared from the house where he lodged on January the 21st, 2016. An extensive police search followed to try to find him, but his body was not found until the morning of March the 25th in the River Neen at Water Newton, some 10 miles away from his home. On the 13th of October, the body of a Cambridgeshire woman was found in the River Neen. Lena Patika, 42, from Peterborough, was found deceased in the river at North Bank on April the 3rd, 2022. She was last seen leaving her home in Alderman's Drive, Peterborough, before 7pm. She was going shopping, she said, and then to Neen Park. The body of a man said to be in his 80s was found in a lock on the River Neen. That was on November the 25th, 2022. A paddle boarder in his 40s died after he got into difficulty on the River Neen in Peterborough in August of 2022 as well. In May of 2023, in the area known as Whitsley, a man's body was recovered from the River Neen at North Bank Road. Officers searching for missing man David Stacey, 71, discovered the body on Wednesday, December the 20th of 2023, where in the River Neen. An inquest was opened into the death of Raymond Dean, 77, who died at North Bank. He was also pulled from the Neen. And very recently, on the 17th of January this year, another soul lost their lives in the River Neen, and I am unsure if it's connected. Detectives have been working at a pace to establish the circumstances of her death following formal identification, and she has now been named as Catherine Corry age 49, of Northampton, also known as Cater. She was found in the River Neen, near Mill Lane, in Kings Lindborough, shortly before 8am on Sunday, February the 11th, 2024. Sadly, as I go deeper into this case, I realised that the last three centuries, the body count for the River Neen is huge. It's also the Neen, the Neen washes, and out at sea, and those bodies number into the hundreds. So many people have lost their lives there. I can only go back as far as records allow, but I'd imagine if we searched back to the earliest time we could, the need has taken many men, women and children. I wanted to add some of my own thoughts um, on the case really, and look at it as a whole. So we've got a lady, whose family live in the area for generations, who suddenly buys a house that she doesn't know that she was born in as a baby. Her own mother didn't like the house. She said that 
Christy never settled. My mum said the same about me. If you ask her now, yeah, and she's in the late seventies, she will say, "Our Debbie has never had a night's sleep in her life." When I was seven, they took me to sleep clinic for it. But like Chrissy's boys, I would see things climb the wall. I would see hands, like on that video, come out of my wall. And I've spoken to so many people who are the same, Chrissy included. It's a generational thing that goes down the families. She mentioned a door at the home that they couldn't get to, and they'd never opened and never looked inside. So what's in there? What if that door was made from the wood of the ships, as I suggested earlier? What if the home over 1830 will have had a few repairs over the years, won't it? And what if some of that wood was flotsam and jetsam from the beach? I would imagine Chrissy and her neighbours and her children all bring home shells and interesting bits of driftwood. They probably carry feathers from the woodlands and stones, as we all do. And we bring those things back with us. It could be a piece of furniture, but in this case, I don't I don't think it is. I don't get that intuitively, but it could be. It could be something they'd brought into the home. Now, many people are going to say, well, why haven't she been filming this for years? She wasn't interested in filming paranormal activity. She has a young son who suffers with autism and he'll get up quite early. So they put the cameras in to make sure that he was self and well. And I understand that completely. When the Tesco driver, well, she thought the Tesco driver had pulled up and the dogs kicked off. She looked at the camera to see where the driver was and he wasn't there. And that's when she heard that awful voice in the garage. Voices, awful, whatever it is, I don't know, it's awful. And that made her go back through the cameras. And that's when we caught, she caught the moving shadows and this really hand that just comes from nowhere it really apoports from the door and kind of holds on to the jam there now at the time Chrissy and her son were in the kitchen with the dog they didn't hear anything they didn't sense anything but the children have all experienced something Chrissy's partners have experienced things as has Chrissy herself so that tells me the common denominator is the home itself when her ex-husband moved away all of that ended for him like he'd walked away from that negativity. Now, we could have a lot of things going on here. We could have, as I would suggest, many souls that can see Chrissy and are trying to get communication with her. And I explained to her that she needs to kind of manage that like you would if you were working in a pie shop or you were working behind the bar. You tell people to wait and you deal with one at a time and they have to wait. It has to be on your terms. I've also suggested to her that she has a word, goes down to the river and put some flowers there or some, you know, a feather or some just thoughts, put her thoughts out there for those souls that are out there in the water and show them the way home. The negative energy itself could be held there or holding things there. And that can be dealt with very simply by taking his power away. So I'll help Chrissy with all of these things going forward as the weeks go on. And what I'd like to do is when we've collated enough information that's come back from the listeners, the people doing the analysts and Chrissy herself, we can sit down and do a part two and go through that in depth. So as I say, add your comments below, please. I, I am I'm, I'm more than interested or email me. I think there are many people like that out there. I know it's the same for my family, my grandmother's side, all of my cousins have experiences and it's the same on my grandfather's side, the same on my dad's family, my mum's family, it goes back down the generations. If I hadn't done a DNA test, I wouldn't know I was connected to the Khan Money Witch from Ireland, I wouldn't have known that about myself. Knowing that at 57 made the world easy for me and finding out that my cousins also went through similar things made it even easier. So I'm at a place of acceptance. It doesn't matter what people say to me. Strange things happen around me and there's nothing I can do about it. And I would like to put those 57 years of abject hell to some use. So if I could swap it for one thing, I would swap it for the normalisation 
of a conversation between people who've experienced this. Chrissy did what my parents didn't know to do. She told her boys, I don't know why this happens, but it happens in our family and it happens to other families too. If I'd have had that tool back then as a small child, I don't think I would have felt so alone. I don't think I would have felt so naughty or that I was playing up, you know, or I was just this really pedantic child that refused to go into her bedroom regardless of anywhere we lived, you know. But that's the look of hindsight, isn't it? You know, my parents weren't given that. They came from a generation where anything strange like that was hidden because the generation before that and the generation before that could be locked up in a lunacy asylum just for speaking about it. When I went through my DNA, I found so many men and women that were locked up for lunacy or for speaking in spirit or one poor lass for speaking to fairies within the woodland, all things that many families still do to this day. We forget that we are not 21st century people. That's where we find ourselves now. But our roots, our ancestors, go back to day one. That soil beneath your feet is in your blood. The rivers, the sea, everything here, mountains, all of it, is in all of us. And each ancestor gives you a genetic memory and we carry that with us. And in times of hardship or when you can't take any more or you feel like there's just too much going on in the house, you ask for those ancestors and ask them to help you. That's what they're for. Every week before I sit down and I voice an episode, would it surprise you to know that I sit there, I get myself comfortable and I have a little word with spirit and I have a little word with the cryptids and I say, right, come on guys, I can't do this on my own. Tell me what I need to say. And that's how I do things. That's how all this comes together and I weave the tale, I suppose is the way that you'd put it. What I'm trying to say is I probably come from a long line of storytellers. My grandfather was one, my father was one. I probably come from a long time, long line of psychics, even though I don't consider myself a psychic. I think what's happening is natural abilities within all humans that are used more in some people than others. Why that happens, how that happens, I don't know. I don't have the answers. I have the witness reports, I have the personal experiences, and I have the experiences of people that are around me. And I don't know any of those people that I would consider weird. Society may, 2024 society may consider them weird, but to me, they're just born in their own century. Put them 400 years ago, you know, and they'd fit in quite easily. You remember the woman that people would run to the door and murder because she was a witch? She probably lived on the edge of the village because she didn't really like being around people like me. Those potions and spells that she cooked up were probably salves and forage and canning and jamming that normal folk would do back then within the homes. Some women made medicine, they call them head witches. And I'm a very proud head witch and I come from a very long line of proud head witches. We take a male's magic away from him the moment they are born. We tell them that they are only brawn. They are only to live in this one image. Anything outside of this image is to be shunned. And it's absolutely ridiculous. Each and every one of us is a unique individual. I've said it before. Thousands of people had to fall in love for you to be here right now. That means that you are an incredible individual. And you hold all of that power within yourself. And when you realise it and tap into it, You see things differently. The scales fall from your eyes. Things that people say no longer matter. Simple things that felt so important before fade into oblivion. You become stronger in yourself. You fit yourself better. You become more confident. And you've just handed yourself a whole amount of tools, haven't you? So if you're out there alone and you're suffering this, get in touch. I spoke to a man yesterday 
who's had experience after experience after experience. I spoke to a man the week before, the same. And each of them says it, all of them say it. You won't believe me because I've had too many experiences. My experiences started in my cot. I'll be a pensioner in three years time. That's a lifetime. Some people like me, just, I don't see it as paranormal or supernatural or strange. It's just part of everyday life that I've somehow managed to navigate because I don't know any other way to be and neither do you. So going forward, we can do one or two things. We can go forward hating it, being negative, raging at it, ranting at it, running away from it. I've done all the other bluff. I've tried drinking to get rid of it. I've tried smoking to get rid of it. I've tried the wrong men the wrong jobs, the wrong eras, the wrong decades, the wrong everything. Write down a list of wrong and I could tick them all off. It was only when I realised that these things are normal to me and accepted it that all of that negativity went away. And now I just go forward, forward positively, don't I? And you can make that choice. You can decide when you turn this podcast off now to look at things in a different light. In the very beginning... I stated that there are teams of investigators that will go into homes and give it the satanic panic. And Chrissy, you've been in touch with a, um, a paranormal team, and they did exactly that. They said it was a demon at the home, and I do not agree with that. I think there's more than one thing going on there. And it's only because Chrissy knows that there are people in the UK now who will say, no, it's, I, I've seen it, I've, I've experienced that, it's like that for me. That she's so brave and she's come forward and she's given all of her personal, you know, contact details, the whole nine yards, and not many people are prepared to do that. But I guarantee you, there'll be a person out there who hears that and says, it's my time. And when you're ready, and it's your time, I'll be here at my desk waiting, but that's up to you. No pressure. Just know that's an option if you want to use it. So going forward... I will definitely, definitely keep you up to date with what's going on in Chrissy's um, home. Make sure the boys are okay, because I know you're all being interested now and invested, so I will keep you up to date with that, don't worry. And as more um, evidence comes in, as I am sure it will, I will also share that with you. So check out the links below. Go and have a look. I've put a little bit of the audio up, and I've put the strange, creepy hand up going on the door. Have a look at those first and let me know what you think. And if you're interested in seeing some of the other videos, just let me know. But as I say, everything's in the description below. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I really, really appreciate that. This is always followed, if you're listening on the podcast, by a Saturday live stream, normally about 9pm on my YouTube channel. If you're listening to this on YouTube, same applies. Five minutes, I'll just go and get myself a drink and then we'll go live and we will chat about the episode on Chrissy and the home and the wash and all of the above. As always, it has been brilliant to get in touch with you. It's like meeting your friends on a Friday. So if you're that class out there in America that listens to me on the podcast with your teacher, no, you have the coolest teacher in the world. If you are that man that lives in the Russian mountains who listens to me every week on a Friday, know that I think about you and thank you. I loved my email. It was really, really good to get it. A very long time ago, when I first started doing what I did, and I said, no one's going to listen to me. Mark said, just think about one little man sat in a shack somewhere in the Ukraine or something like that with the fire on. You can hear the rain on the roof, and he's just looking for something on a radio channel to listen to, and he finds you. And I think about that every single time I sit down to do this. So if you're out there, the man that I've been thinking about all these years, yeah, you have a lot to be thankful for. But yeah, I'll stop my waffling and I shall be back at the same time, the same day, next week. Good night, everyone.